I like to think of Tool as not guitar, bass, drums, vocals. I like to think of Tool as just four instruments. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Lone University. And this week, I'll be covering Schism from Tool's Lateralis album. This was released back in 2001. It debuted at the number one spot on the Billboard 200, which is insane to me still for a band like this. And I believe every album they've released since then has also topped the charts. And a lot of people listen to Tool and go, I don't get it. How is that possible? How are they so successful? It's because they have a completely original sound that's extremely recognizable. That's very hard to do now. And this band is often imitated but never duplicated. In fact, Schism won a Grammy for Best Metal Performance back then. So uh, I want to talk about some really cool things with this song. The composition, some things that really stick out to me. We'll go over the tone a little bit because Justin Chancellor's tone is highly revered and sought after. Uh, but before I ramble on any further, let's jump in. This is Schism by Tool. I've said this a few times in past videos. I really don't think I've ever seen this music video, um, despite hearing this song a bunch. And Tool has never really been like a music video band for me. You know, they've not done a ton. And if I have, I forgot. So I'm looking forward to checking this out. I thought that was the Xbox logo. <laughs> this is an iconic bass lick. Okay, right off the bat, we have a lot of cool things happening with bass. Um, the chords are sort of played on bass and overlaid with kind of a clean guitar on top. Uh, I've worked pretty hard to get my tool tone patch dialed in over the last few months. Uh, I think I've gotten it pretty close. Obviously, I'm not running Mesa High Watt and Galen Krugers, and we'll get into that kind of stuff that Justin actually is running. But, you know, for, for just the Helix, this is it came out pretty well. So right off the bat, we have those kind of bass chords. Now, he might have a different tone going on for a lot of parts in the song. There's some parts where it sounds very dirty and very distorted, very crunchy, and some are a little more glassy. Uh, so not entirely sure if it's all one tone. Maybe someone can answer that. But we start off with these two-note kind of double-stop bass chords, open D string and the B flat on the top, which is kind of like an inverted B flat major. <laughs> Kind of sounds like a pull off there. Then we jump into this iconic bass riff, which is probably why you clicked on this video. Um, it's actually not too bad to play. Obviously, he's using a pick. And the confusing thing about this song, there's a ton of meter changes. Five, se uh, five, eight, seven, eight, alternating here in this bass riff. And there's something like forty or fifty going on throughout the song. We're not going to get in too much into too much of what those are, but this main kind of motif is alternating 5, 8, and 7, 8. So open 10, 12, and you have this sort of repeating melody accent on the top G string. He's just kind of going up there, but those open 10, 12 on the D string kind of circulates over and over again. And the important thing when you play this riff is to make sure those pull-offs aren't cheated out. You really want to hammer them on pretty hard because they really need to be articulate. I hear a lot of people kind of slur that part. You really want to make sure you're not rushing those. You really want to hammer on them hard so you get that diga diga ga 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 diga diga ga 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 ga. That kind of thing. And if you really want to kind of count this and internalize this rhythm, just listen for those top notes on the G string. It's one, one, two, da, 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 and that'll kind of help you count it. That's that's where you get the five and the seven alternating. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the pickup can kind of throw you off. So it's diggity gun. That's where the downbeat is. 
And, you know, this kind of repeats a lot throughout the song. It, it takes it down a fourth, kind of when it gets into that pre-chorus. And we'll get there in a second. Let's keep going. And something else I wanted to point out, I thought a lot about when I was kind of listening to the song before this, Tool has a really, Tool has a knack for kind of subverting what you think they would do in terms of their standard instrument roles. Most rock bands, you know, you have the riff with the guitar player, the bass is playing at an octave lower, the drums keeping time, and the vocal is really out front holding the melody. This band has the ability to subvert that constantly. Sometimes the bass is the riff, the guitar is just doing some atmospheric things, Danny Carey on drums is playing a mandala with pitched notes, kind of timbala percussive stuff. And then Maynard's vocals are almost mixed in a way where they're not like out front. It's almost just like another instrument. I like to think of Tool as not guitar, bass, drums, vocals. I like to think of Tool as just four instruments. And I'll kind of demonstrate some examples of that here in the song. But right here, you would expect the guitar to come in for any other band really low, you know. You know, something like that. That's what most bands would do. But instead, the guitar player comes in and harmonizes it a fourth up. I think it's a fourth. Yeah. Fourth, harmony, fourth harmonies are weird to begin with. And again, this is a classic example of the bass taking the main riff and the guitar harmonizing it higher than the bass. Like You don't see that a lot, and that's why Tool are just so uniquely distinctive. You think it's going to go into something heavy, and now it's flipping the rolls of the guitar and bass. Really cool stuff. Their weird imagery is also very unique to them. Those drums, kind of pitched. It's kind of what I'm talking about. A drummer, you wouldn't expect him to come in with a, a unison part. It kind of sounds like he's playing those kind of electric pads. I don't know if they're called timbalas, timbalas. I'm probably saying that really wrong. Um, but I know he has some electronic pads that are pitched. He can kind of play them melodically. And you kind of get that unison, like guitar, bass, and drums all kind of doing the same thing in pitch while he's still playing a drum beat. And, you know, Danny Carey is, I need no introduction. Um, and the other do you guys. He's insanely, insanely good. <laughs> And something else too, you know, this the, the key of the song is kind of A minor, D minor, which would really just be all white keys on the piano, you know. Oops. But every now and then the vocals have that accidental, which almost kind of implies it to be more of a harmonic minor type thing. You know, the... So... That kind of implies that I'm sure that C sharp or that D flat, C sharp, whatever, um, kind of implies that harmonic minor kind of leading tone. But then when it goes into kind of that drops a fourth, I guess it's a pre chorus. You now, that's another thing, tool. There's really no like verse, chorus. It's just a bunch of sections that are beautifully woven together. So I don't know what this is pre chorus, but it goes down here and it's clearly kind of an A minor riff.
So that leads me to believe that, yes, it's in like A minor, D minor, and there are some B flats in here. So it kind of moves around a lot. You know, that's kind of a typical thing with Tool. It's very D oriented. You know, that's the old joke to every Tool song is in drop D. I think it is. I'm sure there's a few on the earlier records that are not songs like The Flood or Parabola, but they kind of, you know, massage those D minor and kind of going in and out modally between really just A minor with a B natural and then D minor that has the B flat. So it, it, they kind of shift in and out in this piece. Kind of like, is this the chorus? Before we go to this next part, let me point out real quick. The bass hasn't gone any lower than an open A string. Obviously, it starts off with that main motif up here. So I talked about this concept in an earlier video. Let me let it play, and I'll kind of show you what I'm talking about. This is the first time they've sounded like a normal rock band where the bass goes down low and it's kind of under the riff. And they it's like they save that for, you know, three minutes into the piece. There's been no, like, like homogenous, boom, kind of rock band, metal band kind of thing. And they use that as an accent. And the video I'm referencing is Ventura Highway by America. I think it was the first or second video I did. Second where I talk about the bass line is really kind of high up and it kind of saves the low notes for when they're impactful. And it's all about context. You know, if all your bass parts are kind of mid-rangey, whenever you go in to hit that low B or low D, it just has a huge impact because your ear has not been used to it this whole time. Let me back that up and kind of show you the impact that makes. Again, bass has been mid-rangey, kind of high up most of the time. So when it hits that, whatever section of the song this is, it's boom, it just, it has an impact. And Tool use that very sporadically and very intentionally. You know, we're up here in the mid-range. You're kind of like, okay, then it's... Impact. Some great lyrics, too. I'm not going to dive into that too, too much, but, you know, I think the song subject matters about relationships and communication, and when that falls apart, everything falls away, and they're just brilliantly written to kind of fit these meters, and it's like every word has an intentional place and purpose, so it's worth looking these up and kind of reading them outside of the context of the song. They're really great. Ring, cool part where the bass is now abandoning that riff and i talk about this a lot in videos and it's honestly a chance where the bass can be the be in the spotlight is when something else becomes the ostinato ostinato once again is just a repeating musical phrase typically characterized by things changing around it so you notice they were together on that um i guess pre-chorus riff i'm not i'm still not sure <laughs> And the guitar player, uh, Adam Jones, is doing sort of a, a permutation of that. And the bass is now kind of going... Whatever those notes are, but you can kind of hear them switch gears and start kind of subverting and changing that chord progression. See, they're together here. Guitar player stay the same. 
It just gives a really new dimension to this part. And obviously this kind of lingers as this next interlude comes on, but it, it's just the power of how when you change the bass line but keep the guitar part the same, it's a great transition tool to move into another piece. It kind of eases your ear out of it. Really cool. This becomes the ostinato, right? It's a repeating part that's kind of waiting for something else to come in and get in the get in the spotlight. Cool effects here. Some kind of pitch wah kind of thing. This is the part in the concert where everyone takes a joint hit. Clearly remember that, seeing them back in 2007 or so. It was a great show. And I was talking about in the earlier part of this video, it's like he might have switched between a crunchier, heavier tone and kind of a glassier, clean, more smooth sound. But you can kind of hear those top notes have this shimmer. There's not that kind of distorted, it's kind of cleaner, which I only have this main crunch riff kind of dialed in, but you can kind of hear a tonal change happen. It's great. And this bass part going on here is kind of mimicking you know, just a minute ago when I was saying the bass changed under the guitar, it kind of started going back down with the F in the root. He's kind of bringing that back here in the same kind of format as before, but the guitar is doing something different. Now the vocals kind of come in and are dictating the vibe and the feel of the piece. And going back to what I said, you know, Maynard's vocals are never like a vocal lead vocal part. They're just like another instrument. This sounds, this could easily be a, a pad on a key, you know, keys part or something. It could be another guitar part. You can tell it's intentionally mixed in a way to kind of just blend in with everything. And that's not a theory because if you've seen them live or seen any live videos, you know, Maynard's standing in the back in the dark a lot of the time. He's not out front all of the time, very rarely. And I think he uses that intentionally. It's like when he comes out front, it must be for a big part, but he is positioning self, himself on the stage to just be another instrument. That's one of the things I've always loved about this band. It's not like, oh, I love their singer. They all have just such a unique part. And once again, they it's like they swap roles a lot. You know, the vocal part can be as melodic and backgroundish as a guitar part. The bass part could be the lead part like it is in this song. And, you know, this might be why they are as big as they are because nobody really does it like them and just they just have such a a unique keen sense on how to compose and really make the most out of four instruments, guitar, bass, drums and vocals. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> scary. Can have nightmares now. A lot of meter change going on here. I'm not even going to try to wrap my head around it. Um, but real quick, apart in this video, I wanted to at least talk about the tone Justin uses. Obviously, this is well documented, and uh, you know he's very known for using wall basses, which I, I think he probably is. 
you know, agreeing that that is a huge part of his tone. There was a brief period where Justin Chancellor, when I was at the Warwick base camp, he was there getting a custom Warwick. And I was like, wow, that, that's crazy cool. But is he really like departing wall bases? That's just what he's known for. And, you know, he's probably not with Warwick for the same reason I'm not anymore. They just let a lot of artists go. I won't get into that too much, but I think he just can't quit the wall bases because I believe he's still back playing them. But before YouTube and, you know, ant modeling and, you know, just a tutorial and everything out there back in the day, I was a member of TalkBase. I've been a member of that forum since like 2006. I learned so much from it. It's still going. It's a great bass community. If you just want to learn all things bass, you, there's classifieds with rare instruments all the way to nerdy tone discussion, talkbase.com. Huge shout out to them. But I remember when 10,000 Days came out, right around the time I was on that forum, everybody was just dying to learn how to recreate this tone. And there wasn't a lot out there aside what you found in your monthly issue of Bass Player Magazine. And I still think it's one of the most diesel engine weightiest tones there ever was for a metal song. It's up there with like the Black Album. It's like a it's like a crunchier version of the Black Album tone to me, a little more distorted. But um, you know, this is really documented on his Wikipedia page. I, I was just reading it before this. Uh, the the consensus is that he's splitting his signals. That's when you take your output out of your bass, like I am, and you would switch it like a Y split. So you'd have one signal going into one amp and one going into another. Then you would like phase blend them back in run it through effects, put things on the front of the amp. I mean, you could, there's a billion combinations of how to do that. And there's a lot of great videos on here on YouTube to find that. But I know he's using like a Mesa high watt or was at some point. I know he's known for using those that kind of give him that top end grit. And then he's using Galen Kruger for more of a low mid range growl. And I hope I'm paraphrasing what I read correctly, but this is a great technique if you want to just distort kind of one side of the EQ spectrum on your tone and leave the other more clean. So it's not, you know, you still have some fundamental low end. And my first video uh, reacting to Billy Sheehan playing a liquid attention song, he also does a dual split there for the same reasons. Kind of put some drive on that top end of the tone, but leave the low end kind of full. That way you have a fundamental pitch. Otherwise, it all just sounds like a, a big muff pedal just driven out. And I'm not crazy about that tone, but this is perfectly blended and split in a way that gives crunch, but has, I mean, it's like a pizza. <laughs> I mean, you have these sizzly hot toppings and this, you know, buttery doughy crust. Uh, I love tone and food analogies. They really go well together, but yeah, great tone. Bring it back to the intro. And you could play that original bass intro right over this. It's still in the same. They're just bringing it down for some drive. Pretty cool. Cool video. Wow. So there you have it. Schism by Tool from Lateralis. That's their 2001 album. And I think they've had number one albums ever since with 10,000 Days and now Fear Inoculum, however many years later. Fear Inoculum is kind of like their Chinese democracy. It took forever and I think it was well worth the wait. That's a great album. Um, and I really got into this band around 10,000 Days, the, the release of 10,000 Days. That's also on my wall back there. It's number four. I have a 10,000 Days copy on vinyl. Obviously, you know, the pot and vicarious, I was just blown away and had to learn those. In fact, the second YouTube video I ever uploaded in 2006 was me covering the pot. And I almost did that song instead of this one, but this had a little bit more to sink my teeth into as far as the bass playing goes. But yeah, what a band. I mean, unique. Nobody can do it like them. A lot of people try. And it, it just is very telling that they can come back after a 
you know, zillion years of no new record and drop it. It goes number one. People are like, who is this band? You know, there was that tweet going around like, I can't believe they dethroned like Taylor Swift or something. People are like, what are these old guys doing? And it's just a testament to just the cult following they've built over the years and have been so consistently good and are excellent musicians and just have a crazy unique aesthetic. Uh, well, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you comment. Let me know what you'd like to see. Make sure you just like the video. It takes one click. And as of course, always be subscribed. Make sure you're subscribed and we will see you next week. Cheers.